Alrighty. Due to the tight schedule that we have today, let's go ahead and get going. Welcome in, friends. Welcome to the final class. My name is John. If you don't know me already, Program Director for Graduate Professional Success in STEM for UC Irvine. I'm the Co-Director for the Science Policy and Certificate Program that we are celebrating today. So after about 10 weeks of science policy and advocacy fundamentals, career workshops, different types of assignments, including one-pagers, power mapping, policy pitch drafts, writing pieces, we have gathered today for the finale of our 2023 Science Policy and Advocacy Certificate Program for STEM scientists. Woo! So today, our pitch finalists includes 15 of our top performers who have gone through several iterations and feedback cycles with our esteemed science policy experts, as well as one-on-one -on -one sessions with Bree McCorder, CEO and founder of Activate to Captivate. I'm so incredibly appreciative of our reviewers' times, our trainers' time, and of course, our participants' time to take that iterative approach and really improve and get to become a part of this stage today. So these two minute pitches can maybe one day become real life policy changes and that's what we hope for down the line. Just a heads up in terms of how today will work. Uh, I will go ahead and pre present our presenters. I will introduce them briefly, give them their two minutes to present their pitches. The judges which have should have their sheets already, their grading sheets. If you have any issues, please reach out to Amy Ralston to get any help with that. They will be grading numerically based on five criteria, which you all should be familiar with, which is what we used for evaluating your assignments. We'll do a short review with our presenters. I'll ask them one question so that way we can buy some time for our judges to think a little bit longer. We'll have our total sums, which will be coordinated by Amy in the back end. Thank you so much, Amy. And if we have some time at the end, we will ask our judges for their career advice, feedback on today's performance and overall thoughts. So during that time, when we're sort of waiting for our final results, uh, we will have Adriana announce our top five writing winners, as well as our top 20 total uh, finalists for our honorable mentions on the writing pieces. And then of course, we'll have our top three pitches based off of highest average scores. The ties will split the price. The prices are first place, you know, it's not much, $150, second place, $100, and third place, $75, US dollars in particular. Um, and before we get started, I do want to say a big thank you to our program coordinators. This program would not have been possible without um, these folks. Our co-director, my co-director rather, Adrian Bankston, who has reviewed, taught, and really built the curriculum and provided the science policy expertise. She has been phenomenal to work with and a key component of this program. Amy Ralston and Angelian for their support in making sure that the program runs smoothly. We hit our metrics and for moderating our career panel. They thank you as well to our speakers um, and throughout our 10 modules providing the expertise and career wisdom. We also want to say thank you to our reviewers who have actually helped us review over 450 assignments in total. Some of them are actually joining us today and without them we would actually not be able to help pick our top three, our top five, our top 15. So it's incredibly a lot of work and time that they and care that they put into it. And lastly, our collab we want to give a thank you to our collaborating partners for all of the help that they have given us for pulling everything together, making sure that we are cohesive and supporting our efforts uh, to provide education and programming to our next gen scientists and policy makers. Administrative wise, because this is a program. There are a couple few more things on your list to do before you finish out this program if you haven't turned anything in. Uh, go ahead and please do so by the time we get to our. Um, September 30th, and then finally our program feedback, please complete that by September 30th as well. So let's go ahead and jump into our, our main event. I will start out with introducing our judges briefly. So firstly, moving from the left to right, Chanel Matney. She is the program officer in the Forum for Neuroscience and Nervous System Disorders at the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine. Chanel was a 2019 CCST Science Fellow and a past associate editor at JSPG. She was the co-founder of John Hopkins Science Policy Group and a research associate at the Potomac 
Institute for Policy Studies. She's been in this industry and looking at different types of things. So incredibly glad to have you on board today. Our next judge, Joseph Long. Joseph Long is the Biophysical Society slash AAAS Congressional Science and Technology Policy Fellow. He is a biomedical engineer by training, past science policy scholar in residence recipient as well, and now working uh, in the science policy landscape with specific focuses on workforce development and biotechnology. Thank you so much for taking time off despite the crazy day to join us. Next up, we have Diane Karloff. She is a chemistry PhD candidate at Emory, and uh, at Emory, an associate editor at JSPG. In her research, she's designing methods to visualize RNA localization in cells and to identify the characteristics that distinguish promising RNA for drug targets. She's looking forward to building her future career in science policy, and we're so incredibly glad to be able to have you today with us. Our next judge is Christopher Jackson. Christopher Jackson is a AAAS Congressional Science and Technology Policy Fellow as well. His focus for research was on developing nanomaterial tools for biomolecular delivery in plants. He's now leading development and implementation of programs in science, energy, climate, immigration, and equity. We're so glad to be able to have you with us, Chris. Last but not least, we have Linda DeMario. Linda is the Director of Community Engagement at Octane Foundation for Innovation. She was the past Executive Vice President for Greater Irvine Chamber of Commerce. In her time, she has launched and sustained a full scope of economic development and tourism work, including award-winning business retention programs, a successful foreign direct investment initiative to secure expansion-ready life science and technology companies for Irvine, just to name a couple that I found incredibly amazing. At Octane, she is developing and implementing initiatives like Women Leaders and Entrepreneur, STEM Fellows, Nonprofit Accelerator, and The Next Gen. So this is all to be able to grow the impact of the Orange County area for the innovation and ecosystem. Thank you so much for joining us today, Linda. And if you would like to get connected with our judges, please do so on LinkedIn, dropping in their chat now. And without further ado, I can go ahead and stop sharing my screen and invite up our first speaker. All right, so again, I will introduce you briefly. You'll have your time to speak. And then we'll do a short of you and we'll have judges uh, be able to do their grading. Judges, are you ready to go? Yes, I see some nods. Great, excellent. All righty. Our first speaker is Sindali Zimba, scientific officer at the University of Cape Town. Her talk is on recommendations for improving the efficacy of medicine supply chains in rural healthcare. Take us away. Hi, everyone. Um, I am Pindile. I have a PhD in medical virology from the University of Cape Town. Uh, we are independent policy analysts advocating for secure medicine supply chain in rural areas. My rural upbringing exposed me to, to the harsh reality of lacking fundamental access to human rights, for example, um, uh, proper health care. During the pandemic, I lost close family members due to delayed access to vaccines or chronic medications. Today, we are asking the Minister of Health to establish an expert committee responsible for implementing tailored programs to enhance medicine supply chains in rural areas. This committee should consist of policymakers specializing in public health, procurement and supply chain management, transportation, IT, as well as the community leaders. Based on our thorough review of the literature and engaging with the rural health advocates, we recommend that the committee initially focus on feasible solutions, such as implementing electronic stock tracking systems, employing pharmacist assistance to optimize workload, providing training, enforcing compliance, and introducing reliable, reliable satellite internet. To address corrupt tendering practices and delays, these experts should be involved in specifying awarding and paying tenders. By implementing these recommendations, we can work towards a more equitable healthcare that better serves the needs of the rural communities in need. Thank you. 
Excellent. Thank you so much for your talk. All right. So for while the judges are grading, one of the questions that you selected was what did what compelled you to attend this course and did you achieve what you sought out to do? Uh, after finishing my PhD, I realized that I didn't want to be in academia and I want to be more in science pillars in policy, but I don't have any experience. So what I was looking for is to have hands-on experience just to see if this is really what I, I am looking for. So for sure, I got really what I wanted. For example, last week I had an interview and you know, I had so much to talk about science policy. So thank you so much for this opportunity. And I've also realized that I have so much transfer, transfer, transferable skills that I can use to whatever care I that I can explore in future. So yeah, that's what I did. Thank you. It's really wonderful. Thank you so much. Alrighty. So next on our lineup, we have Georgia Klein. Georgia Klein is an undergrad actually one of our few at Harvey Mudd College. Her talk is on preventing health harms from highway air pollution. Take us away. Great, okay. Representative Rachel May. This summer, our lives were disrupted and our health was impacted by the wildfire pollution coming from Canada. But every day, dirty air blows into the homes of your constituents who live near highways. In New York State, over a million people live within 500 feet of a major road or highway and a disproportionate amount of them are people of color. Also, a third of students in New York State go to school near a highway. I know I'm within 500 feet of a major road all the time, and when I am, I think about all the people who spend a large amount of their day breathing in highway vehicle pollution. Long-term exposure to air pollution from highway traffic impacts one's cardiovascular health with children, older adults, those with pre-existing conditions and people of lower socioeconomic status being most at risk. As a scientist with research experience in air and vehicle pollution modeling, and as a resident of New York, I'm here to ask you to promote legislation to help prevent negative health impacts for New Yorkers from highway pollution. Just last year, you sponsored a bill that passed in the New York State Legislature preventing highways from being built within 500 feet of existing schools. This is amazing. Thank you. Now, to expand on this, what about the people who already live, work, and go to school near highways? What about elders and people of lower socioeconomic status who are at greater risk? I'm asking you to introduce and support legislation to provide relevant public health information to households and businesses near highways and to provide access to free or low cost air filters and filter replacements to schools, as well as elders and low-income families who live near highways. Your support of this legislation will promote New York State's commitment to environmental justice and prevent the development of cardiovascular health problems for your constituents who live near highways. Thank you for your time. Excellent, Georgia. All right, so for your question that you had asked is similar to our first one, what compelled you to attend this course and did you achieve what you sought to achieve? Yeah, I mean, as you mentioned earlier, I'm an undergrad and I'm really excited to hopefully work in science policy and learn about it more. There doesn't seem to be a lot of undergrad specific resources. You know, I've taken like policy classes, but they mostly aren't with scientists. So I was really hoping to gain some of the perspective and also like, you know, communicate with other scientists who are learning this for the first time. And this course definitely helped me achieve those goals. I'm so glad that you were able to join us and to be able to, be able to participate so early in your career. So yeah, thank you. Congratulations and thank you. All righty. Up next, then, we have Spencer Waters. Spencer is a PhD at the Georgetown University, and his talk is on regulating the use of AI in preclinical drug development. Take us a look. Great. So as a biomedical researcher who works with both animal and computer models, I believe there is a need to regulate the use of artificial intelligence in pharmaceutical research. I therefore propose that the U.S. Food and Drug Administration implement policies guiding the use of AI in preclinical drug testing. As of 2022, the FDA can now authorize drugs to enter clinical trials based solely on data from AI and computer modeling. The use of computerized methods for preclinical drug testing was approved by Congress through the FDA Modernization Act 2.0. This act repeals federal regulations that mandate all drugs undergo safety testing in animal models prior to human use. 
Although this legislation facilitates the use of AI in preclinical drug testing, it fails to provide any regulations that ensure the safety of drugs developed solely through AI. This lack of regulatory oversight could jeopardize patient safety and highlights the need for new FDA guidelines. I propose such guidelines should be based upon the three R's of artificial research, replicate, report, and restrict. The first R is replicate. This principle is based on verification through reproducibility, and this would mean that all AI drug testing must be replicated by at least two independent labs before proceeding with clinical trials. The second R is report. This principle is grounded in transparency and public trust. Accordingly, all computer models from AI testing should be made publicly available. The third R is restrict. This principle aims to prevent over-reliance on AI. To do this, the FDA should limit the use of AI in preclinical drug development only to biosimilars and generics of previously approved drugs. The U.S. government has strictly regulated the use of animal models in research since 1966. However, the use of computer models remains unregulated. I believe that the FDA Office of Clinical Policy is uniquely positioned to provide this regulatory oversight. That is why I'm calling upon Winifred Meeker O'Connell, the director of this office, to implement the three R's of artificial research during FDA review of preclinical testing that involves artificial intelligence. Excellent. Thank you, Spencer. So for your question, while judges are grading, you chose, what's something new that you learned throughout this course? Yeah, one thing that I think I learned was that policy is not limited only to federal government and, and Congress. Um, I think I was very uh, excited to learn that you can get involved on in local governments. We can also get involved um, through uh, pre-existing channels like, like the FDA or uh, regulatory bodies without needing to go through Congress. That's a great spotlight there. Thank you so much. Congratulations and good job. All righty. Our next speaker is Nicholas Martinez. Hi, thank you. Let me um, you. Yeah. Can I introduce you? Unless you don't want to. <laughs> uh, Nicholas Martinez is a master's at the University of California, Irvine, sa, 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 and his talk will be on reviving the white abalone, fostering restoration and economic advancement in Southern California. Take us away. Thank you so much. So again, my name is Nicholas Martinez, and I am a master's student at UC, UC Irvine's Conservation and Restoration Science Program. With action and support from Senator Josh Newman and the Executive Director of the Ocean Protection Council, I would like to propose a new subsection to California's Coastal Act, Article 3, Section 302.22.5. This proposed subsection A will allow for the commercialized production and sale of endangered species to prevent the closure of species-dependent fisheries through conservation aquaculture. I bring this proposal before you today with a fishery that could have been preserved with this new subsection and could possibly be revived. The white abalone fishery was a quintessential component of Southern California's economy and culture. At its peak, the commercial and recreational fishery was bringing in about $4.2 million per year, which today would be about $29 million. However, this species experienced a 99.9% .9 decline, resulting in the complete closure of the fishery and the subsequent way of life for a lot of fishermen. This proposal recognizes the inherent ties between coastal economy and environmental stewardship. California already has the infrastructure to set conditions for these aquaculture industries. The state, for example, may introduce criteria mandating businesses to allocate a portion of their produce and technologies to restoration efforts. This will present new ways in which private enterprise and state-funded restoration projects can work together to revive or, more importantly, maintain profitable industries while increasing restoration. By supporting state-sanctioned commercial aquaculture of endangered species, we unlock a win-win scenario by providing fishermen the option to transfer their skills to aquaculture as opposed to the complete closure of their fishery and subsequent way of life. Subsection A provides the perfect opportunity to help current and future fisheries by joining private enterprise with restoration. With funding coming from private investors, we can reinvent the way we the way we look at endangered species recovery by pioneering environmental conservation and economic prosperity. Thank you. Wonderful, great closing. All righty, so as our judges are grading, I do have a question for you. Um, you chose, what compelled you to attend this course and did you achieve that? Yeah, so I certainly think I did. Uh, my background is in marine biology. I did a lot of shark research and coral restoration work as well. 
Um, and working out in Florida for as long as I did, I started recognizing the firsthand impacts of coral bleaching due to climate change and the effects of urbanization on sharks. So I really wanted to change my focus from research to more of like a, an active conservation role. And that's why I joined my UCI program, which is only about six years old, so still a new field. Uh, and that's why I joined this program, so I could also learn more skills and get better at what I'm doing. <laughs> That's really awesome. I'm so glad to be able to call you a fellow UCI daughter. All righty. Thank you so much for this. Up next, we have Favor Narice. Favor is a PhD candidate at the Stanford University, and her talk is on Free Mind, the urgent need for neural rights governance in the U.S. Take us away. Thank you. My name is Faven Aris, and when I was 13 years old, I successfully controlled a cockroach's movements by stimulating its brain. Today, I can decode a human's thoughts into speech. Tomorrow, your most intimate desires, deepest fears, and cherished dreams could no longer be private. This isn't a dystopian novel plot, but a reality we could face without proper federal regulation of neurotechnology and neurodata. I am a researcher studying digital biomarkers that predict brain disorders like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. While working with brilliant academic and industry experts, I've witnessed the transformative power of Neurotech in addressing conditions that affect more than 1 billion people around the world. I've also seen precedents and grave potential for misuse of these technologies, and that is a future we must prevent. I represent FreeMind, an initiative seeking a governance framework for regulating Neurotech, particularly for non-medical use and neurodata privacy within the United States. To Congresswoman Eshoo, while California has enacted robust data privacy laws like the California Consumer Privacy Act and the recently proposed Create AI Act, there are still limitations on data liability and no direct data protection regulations. The global market for Neurotech is projected to exceed $24 billion by 2027. Still, there have been few inhuman clinical trials for Neurotech, and increasing issues are being raised, like altered personalities and unforeseen long term injuries. By establishing a Neurotech and Neurodata governance framework, we expect decreased misuse incidents, increased public trust, and a thriving, responsible Neurotech industry within the US. Congresswoman, I urgently seek your support in convening a bipartisan task force, including diverse experts in academia, industry, and law. I also recommend engaging public participation to promote awareness of these issues and develop new rights legislation. In the age of new technology, the mind is the final frontier of privacy. Let's ensure it remains free. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Faber. All right. So your question, as the judges are grading, was what was your favorite mo module or moment and why? Yes, yeah, so they're very, they're too many to pick, to be quite honest. I really, really enjoyed um, every single aspect about this course. I think, however, my favorite one, if I had to choose, would have been the in-class memoriam that we did for Tenda Moringo, whom we lost um, right at the beginning of the course. Um, I shared in the chat briefly that I exchanged a few words with Tenda, and what stuck out to me the most was when we talked about her commitment uh, to SG SDG4, which for her experience and mine growing up in Africa, just like she did um, in a community where e education is not free and accessible to every little girl and boy. Um, it was a very real and human moment. Um, and it really affirmed my motivations to do all I'm doing now, being first in my family, to pursue a PhD at one of the best institutions in the world and to be a part of this program. And so I just found it to be such, honestly, I think one of the most heartwarming moments I've ever experienced in a professional space um, and I just felt like this was a place where I could belong because we have moments like that. So thank you for that. Absolutely. Thank you. And her life and her legacy continues to live on through your efforts. So thank you so much for bringing that up today. Alrighty. So our next speaker is Maxim Domot. Let me bring you up. Alrighty. Maxim is a postdoc at the University of California, San Diego. And his talk is on empowering Alabama's academic future, advocating for graduate student stipend increases. Take us away. Thank you. Good day, Congressman Strong, and thank you for your valuable time for this conversation. I'm Maxim Dolmut, a recent doctoral graduate from the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Having experienced the challenges of graduate school firsthand, it pains me to witness fellow graduate students in our state grappling with financial difficulties. 
That's why I'm here today wholeheartedly advocating for a 30% increase in their stipend. Graduate students were instrumental in securing over $1 billion in research grants for the state last year. Hence, advocating for a 30% increase in, of graduate stipends is an investment in our state's future, especially in Alabama's aspirations to become the Southeast premier by tech hub, which relies heavily on supporting local education system, particularly graduate students. Recently, seeking better pay and working conditions, nearly 50,000 of academic workers in California went on a historic strike, which disrupted both classes and research across the entire UC system. Yet, it resulted in a substantial pay increase and sparked a nationwide unionization movement with similar strikes occur occurred across universities in the United States, Canada, and the United Kingdom. As a result, many universities, including Princeton and the University of Pennsylvania, offered historic increase in research stipends to attract and retain doctoral students. However, Alabama still lags behind with graduate stipends 25% lower than the state's medium per capita income. This financial struggle discourages many from pursuing doctoral degree in our state, jeopardizing our academic future. Your role, Congressman, as a member of the Science, Space, and Technology Committee is crucial for strengthening our education ecosystem. Thank you, Congressman Strong, and together let's create a brighter future for scientific advancement in our state. Excellent, thank you so much, Maxim. All right, your question was, what was your favorite module and moment and why? Yeah, actually, I think I chose this uh, question because I didn't uh, find a better category, but I just wanted to say kind of like thank you uh, and to people who've been here because it's been a great part of being of the group with similar mind people. And I think a lot of ideas for the pitch uh, actually came out from breakout rooms. So uh, my favorite module is being just in a breakout room talking in uh about other features and getting ideas about my project and, and just see what people are working about and how passionate people about uh, their advocacy topic. That's really awesome to hear. I'm so glad that the breakout rooms were effective and gave you that <laughs> opportunity to speak with others. Thank you so much for your chat and congratulations. Thank you. All righty, so next up for us is Cosette Snyder. Chrisette is a PhD at the University of Maryland School of Medicine, and her talk is on accelerating universal influenza vaccine development. Go for it. Great. So I want everyone to imagine what would have happened if we had a vaccine that could have prevented the COVID-19 pandemic before it started. This is the goal of a universal flu vaccine, which researchers like myself are currently trying to develop. In early 2020, I was actually developing mRNA vaccine for malaria, the technology for which later served as the foundation for the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine. Through this experience, I witnessed firsthand how immense and wide reaching the benefits of pandemic vaccines can be, but I also appreciated how much devastation could have been prevented if we had the policies, technology, and infrastructure in place to manufacture and deliver vaccines before the pandemic began. The next pandemic is not a question of if, but when, and the most likely cause of the next pandemic is influenza. Without warning, an entirely new strain of flu may emerge that is capable of causing a pandemic, and this has already happened four times in the last century alone. The inevitability of the next pandemic and the benefits of vaccination are actually what motivated me to pursue a PhD in immunology. My thesis research is focused on the development of a flu vaccine that can protect us against potential pandemic strains that may arise in the future. Because as we learned from the COVID-19 pandemic, the best time to develop vaccines for a pandemic is in non-emergency times before it begins. However, I've also encountered the firsthand the many scientific and operational obstacles to rapid vaccine development. This is why we need the members of Congress, along with the Department of Health and Human Services, to initiate a centralized effort to accelerate universal flu vaccine development before the next pandemic happens. Um, through the establishment of a collaborative single mission entity tasked with invigorating the necessary research, we can expect to accelerate the development of a broadly protective flu vaccine capable of preventing the devastating economic and human loss the next pandemic would bring. Thank you. Excellent, thank you, Kosa. All right, so for your question, you wanted to answer, what are your plans to post the course, professional or personal? What's moving, what's on the horizon for you? 
Yeah, so I'm, I just started my third year of my PhD. So the, the most immediate plan is to finish my PhD. And then after that, I want to do um, some postdocs and staying in the vaccine world to eventually transition into a policy position where I could advise vaccine policy. That's awesome. Looking forward to it. See you on the other side when you're there. You got this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good job today. Alrighty. Our next speaker is Molly Marr. Pulling me, pulling me up for everyone. Molly Mar is a residency at the MGH McLean, and she has her talk on increasing access to youth mental health services. Take us away. Hi, everyone. My name is Molly Mar, and I'm a resident psychiatrist at Massachusetts General Hospital. Senator Wyden, I'm asking you to increase access to youth mental health services. Every shift, I witness the ongoing youth mental health crisis. Children are on stretchers after suicide attempts, waiting for an inpatient bed that may or may not open up. Children are discharged without access to outpatient services. What I'm seeing daily is a reflection of something that's happening across the country. Since COVID, one in three young adults has experienced mental illness. Suicide is currently the second leading cause of death for youth 10 to 14 years of age. The Surgeon General officially recognized the youth mental health crisis a year ago, but since that time, little has changed. That's because there's a lack of access to mental health services for youth across the care continuum. The problem is driven by inadequate reimbursement by all payers. Fortunately, there's a solution and it aligns with the work that you are already doing in Congress. I'm asking you to support three solutions to increase access. One, Require uniform, federally set, Medicaid, and ACA coverage plans with adequate reimbursement for the full continuum of mental health services. Two, enforce the Mental Health Parity Acts with a focus on adequate reimbursement. Three, provide tax incentives or block grants for hospitals, rural health clinics, and federally qualified health centers to create new services for children so they have access to the services they need when they need them. Addressing youth mental health needs as soon as possible reduces the burden on families, schools, and public health systems, and sets our children up to be successful adults. Thank you. Thank you so much, Molly. That is a topic for me personally. Good thing I'm not judging. That's dear and close to my heart. <laughs> so for your question, if you wanted to be asked, what's something new you learned throughout this class? I was, I learned so much from all the writing work because I came into this having some background in writing, but in consensus study approaches, which is so different and realizing like the pitch versus a one pager versus a memo versus an op-ed versus, I, it was really useful to, to understand how different those needed to be and really the framing. And I am so grateful for all of those activities. That's really awesome. And to your point about the nuances, as a first time going through this, I definitely learned a lot on the back end. So I definitely echo that thought. Thank you so much and congratulations, Molly. Thanks. All righty. Our next speaker is Emma Koltoff. Bringing her up. Emma is a PhD at the Wake Forest University School of Medicine, and her talk is on improving patient access to community health clinics. Take us away. My name is Emma Koltoff, and I'm a PhD student who uses 3D printing to support local healthcare clinics. Representative Kathy Manning, healthcare is a fundamental human right, and we are responsible for ensuring that everyone in the U.S. has the opportunity to thrive. Today, I am asking for your support for projects that will improve the quality of care that federally funded community health centers or CHCs are able to provide. CHCs provide affordable health care options for the more than 28 million minority, low income, and, un and uninsured individuals across the U.S. These individuals may live in rural areas, far from major health, health, cl health clinics, and may not be able to pay for medical care that they require and deserve. Yet while these centers reduce the burden for individuals to receive care, they do not solve their issues entirely. 3.6 million U.S. adults without access to a vehicle or public transit went without needed medical care last year, and 25 million people in the U.S. do not have access to internet at home, preventing them from utilizing telehealth platforms when they can't visit, visit a physical clinic. When these individuals do not seek care, it can impact their long-term health. 
Of the patients who do make it for an initial visit, up to 25% are unable to return for follow-up visits, resulting in unpredictable cancellation rates that impact future support for CHCs. By targeting these infrastructure and technology challenges on a local level, we can make care from CHCs more accessible. To make this vision a reality, we are asking for three main policy changes. Supporting proposed and ongoing projects, which can bring internet access to rural areas, enabling telehealth access. Advocating for extension of public transportation systems to reach individuals in transport deserts. And promotion of community partnerships between CHCs and technology development groups to expand patient access to therapy tools. CHCs are the only choice for healthcare for many people. Investment in local infrastructure and development greatly increases the impact these centers can have on the health of our country. Thank you for your time. Excellent, thank you so much, Emma. All right, so your question was, what compelled you to attend this course and did you achieve what you sought out to achieve? Yeah, so I think like many people here, I'm both a scientist and an advocate, um, and I really wanted to figure out how to connect the two better. Um, and I, I kind of struggled to figure out how to navigate the policy space because it was new to me. Um, so this course felt like a really great way to like dive right in and learn the skills, the, the or, oral skills, writing skills, like power mapping, everything that was mentioned previously, and even just like the basics of researching both unfamiliar science and like people in the policy space that I needed to impact as well. So I got, I, I think I achieved all of it. <laughs> That's awesome to share. Those are our metrics that we're checking off for our project. <laughs> we'll take that. Alrighty, thank you so much, Emma. Congratulations and great job today. Alrighty, so our next speaker is Meredith Sutton. Let me bring you up. Meredith is a PhD at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, and their fun and their talk is on funding for treatment of nitrate pollution in well water in Nebraska. Take us away. Thanks. Uh, hello, my name is Meredith Sutton, and I'm a PhD student at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. Uh, I'm here today because I'd like to speak with you about continuing your support for community level water treatment programs here in Nebraska. I work with the Citizen Science Plus Water Quality Project, where one of our primary goals is to better develop the understanding and data coverage on nitrate and phosphate pollution uh, in domestic well water in Nebraska. Since 88% of the population of Nebraska obtains their drinking water from groundwater, it's an important topic across the state, but especially in rural and agricultural areas where that percentage is even higher. Working with the public so far, we found that 18% of well water samples uh, that we've tested have nitrate concentrations at or above the US EPA drinking water standard. Now we know the Nebraska legislature is not unaware of this issue and the health concerns that nitrate in drinking water can cause due to the current programs funded um, to help with treatment such as the reverse osmosis uh, rebate program. However, this program has a limited funding window and we ask that you renew it for this coming year. Through new partnerships with NRDs in Conservation Nebraska, we've been able to educate constituents about the importance of testing their well water as well as how to do so regularly. With the rebate program, we have a concrete next step that we can recommend to families that test above the EPA standard. Programs like these are sorely needed in the state of Nebraska, and our research group is more than happy to provide information or data to help support further programs to, uh, to assist Nebraska citizens with treatment of polluted groundwater. Uh, thank you. Excellent, thank you so much, Meredith. So for your question, you had wanted to be asked, what's something new that you learned throughout this course? Yeah, I think, um, one of the things that I found the most interesting in this course was the power mapping activities. Uh, obviously, I kind of had, we've all kind of like looked into areas that, um, and people that we wanted to maybe talk to, to uh, help with the issue that we we're concerned with, but the power mapping um, activity gave it such a nice structured um, approach that was really helpful, I found really helpful. Um, and then the breakout rooms during that session, I thought was also really helpful because uh, at least the group that I was with, we got to share a lot of different like strategies that we had come up with personally to uh, help do this research. And I found that really interesting. I'd be very curious to hear about what your <laughs> summary of that discussion was and what your strategies were. 
This is excellent. Thank you, Meredith. So appreciate you and congratulations. Great job. Alrighty, our next speaker is Gabrielle Sarlo. Apologies, I didn't have you typed up quite yet. Gabrielle is a postdoc at the Children's National Hospital. And her talk is on ensuring every child thrives, universal school meals. Go for it. Thanks, Joanne. Senator Kane, help me end child hunger. My name is Gabrielle Sarlo, and I'm your constituent. As a nutritional neuroscientist, I know the key role that food can play in neurological development and function. I wanna thank you for your previous support of federal nutrition assistance programs. Today, I ask that you show your continued support by co-sponsoring the Universal School Meals Program Act. A child in a food insecure household is heartbreaking. On any given day, that child is facing hunger pains from missing meals, worries about when they're going to be able to eat next, concerns for their suffering family members, the list goes on and on. This is reality for 165,000 children in Virginia. Horrifically, this reality holds true for 9 million children throughout the United States. Unsurprisingly, these numbers will only continue to grow with rising food costs and inflation. Food insecurity is associated with acute and chronic health problems, delayed development, and worse healthcare access for children, resulting in a sicklier nation. It also disproportionately affects disadvantaged and underrepresented households. Knowing what we do, we must act now. The Universal School Meals Program would provide free school meals for all children and address major pitfalls of currently available pro programs, such as insufficient coverage for children in need and limited availability of meals during non-school sessions. Your support for this program is a moral imperative and strategic investment in the future of our nation. The program presents the opportunity to yield short-term benefits, such as improved health and academic performance, as well as long-term economic benefits, such as reducing Used healthcare costs, more productive and prosperous workforce. You have the power to align your advocacy for families with tangible action. Investing in our children today is an investment in our nation's future. Help me lay the groundwork for a healthier and wealthier nation by co-sponsoring the Universal School Meals Program Act. Thank you for your time. Excellent. Thank you so much, Gabrielle. So for your question, you have one to be asked, what are your plans post the course, professional, personal? What's on the horizon for you? Yeah, so I am in my second year of the postdoc, and this course has really helped me solidify my desire to go into science policy, specifically in the food as medicine, integration of food as treatment into the healthcare system. So I am currently applying to science policy fellowships like the Presidential Management and AAAS, so I'm in the throes of applications. But um, yeah, I just have to thank all of the uh, speakers and moderators of the course because it has really been foundational in solidifying some of those um, important skills that I'll need to be effective in the future. And it really has just ignited a passion in me that prior to this year, I didn't know that I had. So it's been really a great journey of self-discovery. That is truly amazing to hear. And good luck on those fellowships. You're going to do amazing. Yep. I can't wait to see you. All righty. Congratulations and great job. All right, we're rounding the corner towards the end, guys. Just hold on tight. We're almost there. Our next speaker is Ella Spurlock. Ella is a PhD at the University of Washington. And her talk is on fostering a quantum valley in Washington state, the necessity of government aid in the development of quantum information science. Take us away. Thank you, Joanne. Hello, Representative Slater. My name is Ella Spurlock, and I'm a chemistry PhD student at your alma mater, the University of Washington. My research focuses on creating next generation materials for technologies such as quantum computing, which is why I'm here today. If the legislature doesn't act now and fund quantum computing research in 2024, Washington will miss the opportunity to house the quantum valley of the United States. Quantum information science will revolutionize the world. It will open the door to new technologies such as quantum computers, sensors, and communication networks. Compared to the classical technology that we use today, their quantum counterparts are faster, safer, and more robust. Since fundamental quantum research is being conducted at UW, now is a critical time for investment. 
If the state legislature provides financial support for quantum technologies, you will demonstrate your commitment to not only scientific research, but also Washington's economy. The Boston Consulting Group estimated the ec economic return on investment for quantum technology to be up to $850 billion over the next few decades. Governmental investment will also ensure the creation of a new quantum trained workforce. This new workforce will recruit industries to Washington, like IONQ's recent expansion into your district, and foster an innovation hub for quantum startups. Other industry partners such as Amazon Web Services, Boeing, and Microsoft are all working towards the shared goal. However, without direct governmental aid, Washington will fall behind in quantum research. Luckily, the WEIAO board that you're a part of laid out UW quantum initiative funding in your December 2022 annual report. This $3 million ask was denied for the 2023 fiscal year, but it is on the table again for the 2024 fiscal year. I ask that as a Washington state STEM legislator, you support this funding to make Washington a test bed for new technology and make Quantum Valley a reality. Thank you. Oh, excellent, thank you so much, Ella. You know, I, that was the first time I ever heard about the phrase Quantum Valley. It's catchy, I can see that. So yeah, it your, really is. Yeah. <laughs> so for your question, you wanted to answer the question, what are your plans post the course, professional, personal? What are you looking forward to? Yes, yeah, so I'm currently going into the second year of my PhD. So really doubling down on the research and focusing on that. But on top of research, I'm also participating a lot in the student government, the Graduate Student Senate on my campus. And there I am actually the chair of the Science and Policy Committee. So I'm really looking forward to taking what I've learned in this course and uh, really letting it have an impact on my work in that committee and having it impact other people at my university. That's awesome. I'm looking forward to those changes that you're gonna be making. Thank you so much, Ella. Thank you. All right, our next speaker is Brianna James. Brianna is a postdoc at the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, and her talk is on prioritizing electric school buses in Ward 5, D.C. Take us away. Thank you. <clears throat> Councilmember Zachary Parker, my name is Brianna James, and I would like to discuss the importance of prioritizing electric school buses in Ward 5, D.C., I'm a postdoctoral fellow with a research background in severe asthma and lung disease. And when I'm not in the lab, I enjoy jogging around my neighborhood in Brentwood, DC. But during these runs, I pass a train maintenance facility. I stop for dump trucks and haulers while also running past the busy asphalt plant. Now, I am not a long distance or exceptionally fast runner. These industrial sites are within walking distance from each other and residential homes. And now just a few blocks away, a bus terminal is being built and I am tired. The 1601 West Bus Terminal will hold over 200 school buses. And these type of vehicles emit air pollutants in their exhaust that triggers asthma attacks and other respiratory diseases. This is why myself along with the Ward 5 Advisory Neighborhood Committee and advocacy group Empower DC strongly oppose this terminal. It threatens an already burdened community with an additional source of air pollution. I commend you for also speaking out against the terminal, but since it's happening anyway, I urge you to prioritize replacing its diesel school buses with electric powered vehicles. DC has already been awarded a $7.6 million grant by the EPA to purchase electric school buses. And our Department of Energy and Environment also released a transportation electrification roadmap, which outlines a 24 month pilot program for an electric bus system. Seeing that Ward 5, holds almost 50% of the industrial burden of the entire city, it would be a strong candidate for this initiative. I ask that you and other council members of the Transportation and Environment Committee to move forward with this roadmap and advocate for the 1601 West Bus Terminal, be a recipient for this funding and the initial site for the electric bus pilot program. With action, we can mitigate air pollution and protect the health of my home, Ward 5. Excellent, thank you so much, Brianna. I not a long distance runner, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I am not. <laughs> I don't blame you. So for your question, it was on what was your favorite module and moment and why? Um, so my favorite was two, which is kind of cheats the question. I enjoyed um, the panel 
of people who are of different science policy careers, just because I'm always interested in hearing their progress, the pathways that they took to get to where they are. That was very enlightening. Um, and like a few others, I really enjoyed the power mapping uh, module because I was really my introduction to sort of understanding the strategy behind advocacy and how understanding the policymaker or your stakeholders, um, not only political views, but their values um, and how to use that so that you can push policies and sort of cooperation you know, instead of fighting against the current. So that was definitely a favorite. That's awesome. Definitely a note towards Melissa and her team and Union of Concerned Scientists. Thank you so much, Brianna. Awesome job today. Congratulations. Thank you. Alrighty. Our next speaker is Lourdes Davis. I'm going to add her up here. Lourdes is a PhD at the University of Texas at Austin. And her talk is on the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. This one. Thank you so much. Representative Crockett, I am here today to ask that you co-sponsor the Migratory Bird Protection Act, H.R. 5552. Three billion birds have disappeared from the United States since the 1970s, and the Migratory Bird Treaty Act of 1918 has been weakened under the Trump administration. However, I'm not here because of my passion for birds. My name is Lourdes Davis, and I research environmental toxins and their effects on neurodevelopment. Certain synthetic chemicals, such as industrial pesticides, disrupt the body's hormone system. Neonicotinoid pesticides, the most widely used insecticide in the United States, are neurotoxic pesticides that may also act as hormone disruptors. This class of pesticides, which have been nicknamed neonics, are known to have devastating effects not only on insects, such as honeybees, but are also lethal to vertebrates, such as migratory birds and aquatic wildlife. Additionally, neonics may also pose a threat to human health, as chronic exposure is associated with disrupted development and memory loss. Last year, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency admitted that the three most common neonics used in agriculture likely harm approximately three quarters of all endangered plants and animals, including several species that are protected under the Endangered Species Act. However, the EPA has steadfastly refused any motion to ban the use of these pesticides, all of which have been banned in the EU since 2013. And just last year, the EPA refused to remove neonics used as seed coatings from exemption under the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodanticide Act. The Migratory Bird Protection Act aims to extend protection for birds by prohibiting the incidental killing of migratory birds by commercial activities, such as with these pesticides. This act is a critical step to protect these birds and encourage tighter regulations on neonicotinoid pesticides, protecting not only our birds, but our bees and farmers as well. Texas has nearly 250,000 farmers and ranchers, and by co-sponsoring HR 5552, you are showing your commitment to protecting the health of our state's ecosystems and the Texans who work with our food. Thank you. Excellent, I think you so much, Lourdes. All right, so for your question, what's one thing that you wish you knew sooner in life and or prior to the course, and you're actually the only person who chose this question? Um, yeah, I guess, for that question, I would just say I I wish I knew that it's okay to not have everything figured out. Um, I feel like I went through all of my life feeling like I had to know exactly what I was doing. Um, and then I got into my PhD thinking that I was going to go into academia and then realized like immediately afterwards, I, I didn't like academia and I didn't want to do it. And so then I spent like the past two years having an absolute panic attack about what I was going to do and looking into policy and thinking maybe this is it for me. And so I just found it really refreshing. I mean, I know that we're sitting here with some stellar undergrads who are like way ahead of their time and I'm super happy for them. Um, but it's also comforting to sit with people who are doing postdocs and are doing other things and, you know, are, are exploring these options a little bit later on in their career. Um, so I think it's just, I don't know, just shout out to anyone who's also feeling like they have no idea what they're doing most of the time. Um, it's nice to know that we're all figuring it out. That is a sentiment I was thinking to myself the other day. I, I feel so far behind in life. So likewise shared with you. Thank you so much for your talk today. Really appreciate it. Great job. Congratulations. Alrighty. Last but not least, our final speaker. Our final speaker is Sasri Maldipali. She is a postdoc at Georgetown University Medical Center. And her talk is on implementation of consolidated strategies to reduce the burden of anemia in low and middle income countries. Finish us off today. Every second you spend listening to me, your body produces 2 million new red blood cells. 
And by the time I finish, there will be about 240 million fresh red blood cells in your system, which unfortunately isn't the case for a third of the globe's population, especially the biological females and younger children in low and middle income countries. I am Sutri Modepalli. I study blood disorders that lead to anemia, a career choice I made as a result of being someone who's directly affected by this malice. As someone who can very well represent this vulnerable population, I believe there is an urgent need to address how to reduce the global burden of anemia, which is responsible for about 1.7 deaths for every 100,000 people. Anemia, the body's inability to produce enough red cells, is a mass global crisis that adversely affects not only human productivity, but also the economy. The WHO's commitment in 2012 to the global nutrition target to achieve 50% reduction in anemia by 2025 is far from reality at this point due to the recent global crises. This therefore calls for collective action from global leaders, healthcare providers, and citizens across the globe. Firstly, in identifying the socioeconomic markers like poverty and lack of resources, then providing specific treatment and management through medicines and nutritional supplements. Third and most importantly, creating awareness among these populations about the existing malices and potential benefits, and lastly, funding the development of affordable supplements and therapies. While efforts of agencies like the U.S. Agency for International Development have increased the coverage of anemia prevention among these populations, it isn't until we develop more unified regulations through decentralization that we can combat this silent global crisis, because a healthy community is a happy and productive community. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. All right. So our last short of you today with our presenters. Your question is, and again, you are actually one person, the only person who's chose this one. <laughs> so what, if you're not on your current career trajectory, would you have chosen and or to do and or to follow? Well, yeah, since it was my question, <laughs> um, I would have definitely wanted to be closer to um, policy making much earlier in my life, I guess. Um, and not just on the scientific front, but also um, the social science and um, the environmental front, um, trying to like bridge the gap between um, what is available and what is the understanding of the populations um, and the gap between those two, uh, just trying to make them understand like uh, what is being wronged or what is being conveyed falsely uh, versus what they should be acting upon um, as citizens of the globe um, for the environment, for their social regulations, for the society. I think I would have just been a little more closer to what I wanted to do. Well, I'm glad you're on this journey now and you're going towards yes. this today. <laughs> Thank so, you so, so much. Yeah, absolutely. So glad and happy for you. Thank you so much for your presentation. Congratulations and great job. Thank you, Shannon. All righty, guys, we are done. We are done in terms of the presentations, at least. Can we just go ahead and take a pause and give a round of applause to our folks in the chat, whether you want to do it on as an icon, IRL, whatever you want to do. Thank you so much for paying, taking your time today to listen on them. Um, and we are going to take a little bit of a segue before we get to our chats with our judges. And then we will announce the final finale pitch finalists for our presentations today. Um, in the meantime, I will actually pass it along to Adriana for our top five winners, as well as our uh, writing finalists and honorable mentions. So Adriana, I will pass it to you. Great. Thanks, Joanne. Well, this is very enjoyable to watch. Uh, and I'm glad I'm not a judge because uh, it's it's very tough to choose. So sorry for you guys. Um, but a really, really great job. I think after all these weeks, uh, it's been nice to see what where everyone is and how you all have progressed um, throughout the modules and uh, really excited um, to see where everyone is. And you, you will all do great things and we're looking forward to seeing where you go from here. Um, so on the writing, also appreciated the comments on this. I'm glad that this was helpful. It's a big part of uh, any policy role that you're gonna have to do some writing. So um, I think um, my sort of reviews, I guess, from um, having read multiple um, versions of the write-ups that you had, 
um i think you know that's something to keep in mind um that you always have to improve your writing but um the kinds of things that we were looking at when choosing the winners of course there are multiple factors um and judges who score these write-ups so thanks for everyone's time but um we I, I was sort of looking for things that um uh you know the, the papers were well researched um, evidence-based convincing data um timely data and specificity of recommendations and also good policy recommendations that are feasible and realistic um which is something that uh, it's it's impressive what you all have done in this time in, in the writing space too so um those are general comments i think we can move on to the names oh okay great um so we uh, as joanne mentioned i think we had a hard time choosing folks and um it's actually difficult to compare between all the these different formats as well but nice to see the top five um here which have multiple um formats too so we have nathan favor zoella brianna and Tricar. So congratulations um and then we have um Honorable mentions, part of the top 20, again, um, really hard to choose. And you all had really, really great write-ups. Um, a lot of different topics that I think are really timely and important. So was glad to see that. And hopefully um, uh, you all will get these out in the real world and um, um, published and, and pitching to the folks that you want, you want to make change. So... I'm excited to see what you will do with the assignments from the course. So I think that's it for me. Um, anything else? Joanne, back to you. Yeah, we can change gears a little. Buy us some more time. Amy, thank you so much for your help on the back end. Uh, I want to invite the judges, because we actually have some time. We're running early to get some of their feedback, both on career development and advice in the future, as well as um, what they thought about today's session. So the first speaker that I will actually invite up, uh, let me take a second to orientate myself, is Chanel. And, oh, oh, I don't, oh, I see, okay, there you go. Hello. I couldn't find you. There you are. Hello at Spotlight. There you go. <laughs> All right. So as a past science technology policy fellow and now program officer um, at the National Acad Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine, what is your advice to rising scientific leaders inspired <laughs> to go uh, towards science policy and lead a career that's as successful as yours? And then oh, sure. Thoughts um, on I have a new puppy who's crying in the background. So let me just like, well, I give everyone some like puppy dopamine while we're here. Congrats on a great pitch. So, okay. Um, uh, advice. I, I really resonated with one of the presenters. I think it was Lourdes who talked about um, appreciating that it's okay that as like supposed grownups that often we really don't know what we're doing. And so I wanted to va really validate and normalize that. I think a lot of us do behind the scenes in our non-Instagrammed lives go through uh, phases of existential doubt, um, not only just as a, you know, rise as a grad student, but as a postdoc or in any phase of life. Um, and so uh, I think that I, I uh, embraced a little bit of that chaos and um, had a lot of interest uh, and decided, well, I'm not going to make myself pick one. I'm going to sort of follow my nose and decide to uh, pick up skills and um, pick up um, sort of fruitful relationships in all of the environments. And so my resume is like very uh, choppy. Like I had a lot of different positions every six months, every year, because uh, I was just sort of rotating around in science policy positions and uh, cringed a little bit going, oh gosh, you know, I, my career is not as stable. I'm not in one role for, you know, longer than a certain amount of time. Um, and that, and that's true. And that certainly has some drawbacks. Uh, but something that that approach did provide me as a benefit was that um, I have like a really wide ranging diversity of different experiences, having worked in state government, federal government, nonprofit, um, uh, defense contracting, like DOD, uh, you know, consulting group, um, you know, small nonprofits, like, and so now, um, 
I know I have the confidence that I can go into any environment, is it science policy environment, and sort of know my way around, whether it's education, transportation, um, natural resources. And now I'm finally doing what I got my degree in, which was neuroscience, but I kind of did a lot of other stuff outside of that. And so it's okay to uh, work in policy areas outside of your, you know, official academic background training. Um, I think if anything, it really uh, it humbles you, but also broadens your ability to understand that um, science isn't so much what you studied, but it's how you think, like thinking critically, thinking skeptically and understanding the power of data. Um, there's like ev everything has data, right? It's not just, am I working at a bench and um, am I looking at cells or in the field, you know, doing uh, ecological work? Um, it's a way of, science has a way of using um, a quantitative understanding of an issue uh, to address a problem. And in many of the pitch cases today, it was to address a problem to advance equity or to improve the lives of those that are um, have been historically underprivileged or under-resourced. And so I really appreciate how strong that theme was in this group. So I guess my advice was, it's okay to not to have it all figured out. Um, allow yourself to be who you are in this moment today and to follow the interests that you have in this moment today. Um, gather around yourself people who share that interest and passion. They're in the room with you right now. I certainly would count myself among them. Um, it's hard enough going it, uh, but don't go it alone. Um, you'll generate so much uh, camaraderie, sense of shared purpose, mission and values from your peers. You get a lot of job offers and recommendations and references from your peers. Um, I write letters of recommendations for my colleagues all the time. They write ones for me. You learn about jobs that aren't even listed yet because it's just the whisper network. And there's, there's, I can't say enough about the power of having people advocating for you behind the scenes in the whisper network when things are kind of, um, you know, they're looking for the right person. Uh, and so um, uh, really lean on each other. Um, it's okay to, to not really feel like you know what's going on. I think a lot of us really do undersell ourselves. Uh, you're all brilliant. You're incredibly capable. I'm so glad that I was able to be a part of this experience, even just for uh, this afternoon. So that's very long winded, but that that is my advice. I'm really proud of all of you for your hard work. Thank you so much, Now We have to ask, what is the puppy's name? Oh, <laughs> 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 So precious, so precious. Thank you so much for your time today. I know there's a little bit of a glitch on the back end for you for connections, but truly appreciate the words. All right, next up, I will invite up Joseph Long to a spotlight. Joseph, so as a Biophysical Society AAAS Congressional SNT Policy Fellow, what's one or two tips on becoming a fellow? What made you stand out and thoughts on performances today and a career advice overall? Yeah, I mean, I think courses like what you're, you're going through right now are a very clear sign that you're dedicated to policy. So I think it's something that's really going to stand out uh, for any sort of policy fellowship, whether it's AAAS uh, or even at the state level. Um, and of course, I would like to echo what Chanel said, 100% uh, on not knowing what to do. I'm going into this entire process and I'm going into Congress not knowing anything. And that's sort of the, the name of the game. And I think that's something you should just expect through life, right? You know, being an adult, it's already just so challenging. And then dealing with all of these things, you learn how to think and not necessarily how to know when it coming out of a PhD. And I think that's the important point that you have to take away when you're going into policy is how to think. Um, in terms of the fellowship specifically, uh, one thing that I think I've learned over time is I have a tendency to sell myself short. And I think that's something that's uh, true for a lot of people in academia. And so one thing uh, I would like to reiterate is not to be able to, uh, uh, not to sell yourself short, but really know and communicate your impact, however big and small it is. If you think it's small, it's bigger than you, than you think it is. And that's something that you can really use to stand out in any sort of fellowship application. Um, and of course, that includes, you know, getting involved in your community and staying in, in tune with the issues that you care about, being able to talk about your issues. And I mean, these policy pitches that you did today, they're absolutely amazing. I've been thoroughly impressed and made it really hard to judge. So uh, kudos to all of you for your hard work there. Um, and of course, uh, as Chanel mentioned, you know, connect with others, find allies. You know, policy especially is very much about collaboration. And so utilize that to the best of your ability and um, understand where other people are coming from. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I continue to look forward to seeing what is happening with all of your pitches and by all means, just go directly to the policymakers and talk to them because I, I, I was moved by it. So congratulations, everybody. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Joseph. Truly appreciate you taking time and to judge today. 
All righty. Our next judge that we're calling up upon the stage is Diane. Diane Karloff. Hello. How are you? Hey, as everyone. A, as a rising leader in this space and currently an associate editor for Journal of Science Policy and Governance, what's your advice on getting your work published either in GSPG or in a broader spectrum? And what's your feedback on some of the pitches today? Thanks everyone for taking the time to share all the hard work and research that you've put into your pitches today. I think all of them could be the, a solid foundation for an article at the Journal of Science Policy and Governance. I'd say at the journal um, to publish, it's your job to dive deep into the problem and the literature, identify creative yet viable solutions, and then convince non-experts why this is an urgent problem worth solving and how it can be done. And so, um, I think for the pitches, you want to convey the same information, but it was, I think something that really struck me is how much your stage presence draws the audience in. This is, uh, you've got two minutes. So I think one of my biggest recommendations is it might be a little tough, but that is a memorizable amount of content. And if you can be mostly looking in the camera rather than reading off screen, smiling, showing your passion. And I thought it was really striking some of the pitches that started off with a story that drew people immediately in, as opposed to um, I'm speaking to this specific person. That was something that I found really grabbing my attention. Excellent. Thank you so much. Truly appreciate your time joining us today, Diane. Looking forward to seeing the scores on the other side. Thank you. All right. Our next judge that I will be pulling up here is Christopher. Chris Jackson, hello. So as a AAAS Congressional Science and Technology Policy Fellow, what's also one to two tips on becoming a fellow? You know, what made you stand out and thoughts on the performances today? Sure. Um, well, first off, excellent performances. And I think really, really does a great job of, of the skill that I'll highlight here that maybe ties into what Joseph mentioned at all, which is communication. No matter if you're interested in becoming a science policy fellow or interested in kind of science, policy more broadly, right? No matter where you end up, being able to write and talk um, are the two primary things that I do every day um, in my day job. Um, and so being able to do that effectively to, to non-scientists, but also to people who are not experts in science or the issue you're talking about, but are experts in something else. Um, and so being able to communicate and bridge those gaps is super important. So it's glad to see that all of y'all are really developing those skills. I think at least for, on, on the judging side, it's a super realistic experience of kind of what a policymaker deals with, right? They get 15 different things pitched to them, maybe not over the course of an hour, but over the course of a day, 15 totally different topics. You have to kind of recognize how do you stand out? How do you make sure your message gets across in that type of environment? Um, and the kind of work that I do, right? They're, they're, if you're lucky, there's one person that's a quote unquote science expert um, on the policy side. And, and as being that person, having been called that person in offices, I just learned 15 new things that I knew next to nothing about over the course of the past hour. So um, again, in terms of advice, as you're thinking, if you're thinking of uh, applying for science policy fellowships or moving into it more broadly, I'd encourage you to think um, you don't have to move to DC um, to do this type of work. And even before or instead of, you can also, I'd encourage you to think about local. Um, I really liked a lot of the pitches today that, that talked about things like, you know, local city councils and, and local issues. Those are ways you can be super impactful um, and really encourage you to think as you're hopefully um, taking some of these ideas and translating them from, from good ideas to actionable policy, like thinking about how that might apply locally. That's excellent. I know Adriana was a big push on the local level types of work. So I'm glad that that was recognized and was able to be heard. So thank you so much for your time today, Chris. Really appreciate it. All right, last but not least for our final judge, I am so glad to be able to call Linda, one of my great friends. I really appreciate her time today for joining us. And Linda, um, for your question, you know, reflecting back on your incredible executive and community development focused career, what's your advice to rising scientific leaders who are inspired to go towards this type of career and lead a career that is as successful as yours? And then finally, what's your thoughts on today's performances? Uh, well, thank you. Uh, thank you for that intro, <laughs> Joanne. Uh, first of all, I, I tell you, I could just sit here and echo every um, a piece of advice uh, that has been shared, and we are clearly in different generations. So for those that are listening in, there are some things that don't change. 
and the quality of the and the thread of the advice that you're getting, you know, which is that, you know, know what you don't know as well as what you know. And it's okay to not know things and to seek help. Um, critical thinking, which is just astoundingly at risk today. Um, and to be curious, constantly curious, and to always be learning. Um, and to and to have the confidence to be able to present and narrate your case and your cause uh, with passion, but facts to find a way to compellingly connect your facts and make an emotional attachment uh, that's meaningful, uh, the feature rather than, uh, and as well as the benefit. It would be presumptuous of me to say almost anything else to these people, because I'm going to be very candid with you and tell you that you're all operating at, uh, way above my pay grade. In terms of your understanding of the science that you are trying to advance, now, the policy aspect of it, I'm a political science graduate. So, you know, I am deeply involved and engaged in the political aspects of our society. So I will say this to you. I know that you're watching. I know you're listening and understand that part of citizenship is being engaged, not just in public policy, but in citizenship responsibilities. And you may have noticed that science is in great peril these days great peril. And I am alarmed and concerned. But now that I have spent the last hour or so with you, I am greatly encouraged, as I said in the chat box, that the future is in good hands if we all just really make that commitment. So congratulations to all of you. I am so impressed and so proud of you. Thank you so much, Linda. I truly appreciate your, your time and your perspective for today's talk. All righty, guys, we are now rounding the corner to the final component here, which is the final wrap up. And for our announcements for our top three pitches, I will actually go ahead and start with that. If I can make sure I've copied the right thing from Amy. It's reading each other's comment. Thank you, each other. All right, so for our third place, we have Favor Narice from Stanford University on her talk for Free Mind, the Urgent Need for Neuro Rights Governance in the US. Congratulations, congratulations. And then going on to our second place. And I should note, just looking at these scores, they're off by point like five and our 0.25, that's how close this is. So it was incredibly difficult to judge as I can see from the back end. Right, our second place then is Gabrielle Sarlo from Children's National Hospital for ensuring every child thrives, universal school meals, congratulations. Very excellent. And that was off by roughly 0.5. So if that tells you anything. Oh, okay. Our last but not least, our finale grand winner of a large sum of $150 is Molly Marr from MGH McLean. And her talk was on increasing access to youth mental health services. Congratulations, everyone. As the administrator in this, I can only be baffled and to have not very much many words to share other than such a wonderful group of folks and so incredibly honored to have been able to see you all grow throughout this and to see how you guys are able to develop and refine your work. So, so, so happy for everyone. I would like to share my screen one last time. If I can find the button, there it is. All right, let's go ahead and get, get wrapped up. All right, our finalists, congratulations. Great job, everyone. And great job to everyone who has spent time iterating, going back and forth and taking on the reviewer feedbacks. I know not everyone was able to get qualitative type of feedback, 
we really tried to make sure that everyone was able to stay on task and to be able to learn all the major milestones. I just want to give some final words in terms of thank you to our judges for their time and expertise today, their words of advice, our program coordinators, especially my co-director, Adriana Bankston, for helping us establish this program, making sure it runs smoothly. Amy, for helping me on the back end to make sure we got the right people, got the right numbers, and making sure everything ran smoothly. Angela, who couldn't join us today to make sure that all of our messages landed well. Our speakers, our reviewers, and of course, you all as participants. Adriana, if you want to add any final words, I can go ahead and get us wrapped up. Otherwise, we'll take a pause if you have anything you want to share. Sure, just what I said in the chat, I'm really proud of everyone and uh, the work you've done and where you are today from where you started. So uh, yeah, looking forward to following what you will do next and please connect with us on LinkedIn and uh, reach out if you need help along the way. Yes, absolutely. Okay, don't run away quite yet. Y'all still remember, you still have one last thing you need, we need from y'all. Uh, besides your last minute assignments, which is to complete our survey to make sure that you get your certificate, uh, but also that you are able to um, let us know how we did, how we can improve and make sure that we're able to meet the brief every time in the future. So thank you all for your time throughout this program. So incredibly thankful. So I'll stop here and I'll stay back for anyone who has any logistic questions, but congratulations on completing the certificate program. We're done.